I am here today, I'm Sonia, I'm here today with my colleagues, Lauren and Lem. Um, I am coming from uh, Community Credit Lab, um, which if you haven't heard the news, um, we were just recently acquired by Common Future. Uh, so Community Credit Lab works with community-rooted organizations to facilitate community-led impact investing to shift power. Um, and then com uh, Common Future incubates, co-creates, and funds community wealth-building solutions and uses their platform to influence others to bring in capital, to continue to test and iterate new ideas. And I'm gonna pass it to Lauren to introduce herself. Thank you, Sandhya. Good morning, I am Lauren Grattan. I'm co-founder and chief community officer of Mission Driven Finance, an impact investment firm and B Corporation based in San Diego, California, but working across the country. We started with our own place-based private debt fund intending to support inclusive entrepreneurship and uh, economic opportunity, and then had folks coming to us across the country to say, what does that look like for us? How can we create strategies that get capital flowing into our community too? So that's what we do now. We help design, develop, and manage those impact capital vehicles that center community first and help to put together these vehicles that crowd in many different kinds of investors. I'm delighted to be here today and hand it to Lem. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lim White, the co-CEO at Possibility Labs, which is a San Francisco-based social finance and uh, social movement infrastructure platform. Um, we support uh, folks who are funders and investors to make impact investments through um, donor advised funds, sometimes through community pooled funds um, that support community governance, uh, mostly in black and brown communities. Um, and low-income communities so that there's self-determination and that the capital is staying in the communities and that it's building power in those communities um, instead of being driven by funders. Um, and then also support the back office of things like community loan funds, um, co-ops, um, mostly movement groups that are um, sort of on the cutting edge of building self-determination in their communities. And I'm glad to be here with you all today. So I'll pass it back. Yeah, thank you. Um, today, just a quick run of show, we'll be starting off with Lauren and Lem doing a quick intro to what is it that we're actually talking about when we talk about impact first investing. And then uh, Lauren, Lem, and I will share a couple examples of the frameworks that we use at our respective organizations to do and actually practice impact first investing, as well as examples. And then we will turn it over to you all to do a little bit of, of workshop, of a workshopping around a question that we have prepared for you all. And we'll, we'll be circulating if you all have any questions, um, and then we'll come back together at the end. So with that, I will pass it to Lauren to start us off. Great. So as we get to our slides, um, it was here at SOCAP, I think in 2019, before the pause, uh, that I heard from Andrea Armeni from Transform Finance, and he had this great metaphor uh, that capital is the gas in a car, but yet we have been using it to di dictate where the car is going, to decide and build this kind of built environment uh, based on what the gas wants to do. And instead, if we can consider First, where do we want to go? And then let the capital be the gas that helps us get there. Then we can change how that capital flows. So really considering what is the role of capital? How can we consider first what is its purpose before saying, all right, this is what, this is what I need to get out of it. So that's what we're talking about with impact investing. Other friend, uh, Ted Levinson, who's probably been here, uh, has used this statement saying, mainstream investing is moving money based on the future you predict. And we love this, that impact investing is moving money based on the future you want. This framework that you see on the screen should uh, is probably familiar to you. It comes from Sonin Capital. And we see a lot of frameworks that help with the left side of the screen, those 
uh, environmental social governance strategies, public market strategies. Those are a lot of frameworks that have been built out because it's a traditional financial space. If you click one more time, we're gonna focus today on this right side. What, do, what does that mean? Impact first investing in philanthropy, it doesn't actually get into tactics. So that's what we're talking about today. How can we get this into practice? So this is a lot of words on here. The slides will be available afterward, I promise. You can also take pictures of it. Um, but expanding that right side of the screen, the impact first pieces, we have grants on the far right side for operations. It's a classic nonprofit space um, to subsidize access to programs and services. Those, we've got this objective. What is the, what's the intention of this capital on the top part? And then it's, what does this look like in practice? Can be on that bottom row. But we see opportunities to move actually from grants, which frankly are a 100% financial loss. That's money that is going out, never to come back to the grant making organization. But between 100% financial loss and say 15% uh, preferred return, you have a whole lot of wiggle room. There's a lot of structures that you can put in place, such as recoverable grants, forgivable loans, guarantees that help to absorb risk to, in order to unlock that capital that is usually just the left side of the prior screen, that its intention is to pay and be repaid. So there are many, many strategies that we have and tools and tactics that we can use that center community first in order to crowd in more money. So building on that, you know, one of the things that we all focus on is moving from uh, money as uh, an investor, an investee, and a transactional relationship to a more transformational relationship. And when we think about impact first investing, um, the goal is to transform, whether it's um, our communities, the environment, you know, whatever it is, it's, we're, we're trying to transform. And the folks that are closest to the problems that we're trying to transform typically also are closest to the solutions that uh, will transform those things. And so when we think about impact first investing, moving from the transactional to the transformational, going from charity, which is often um, kind of a savior complex, or um, it's really about the, the donor and feeling good to trust-based giving, which is centering the, the needs of the community and those receiving the money to, to design their futures and think about like what do they really need and how they need that money to come and um, be structured. Um, going from single grants, um, to uh, integrated capital, so oftentimes with foundations or funders, there's you know a philanthropic portfolio with uh, foundations that's five percent, with donor advised funds that tends to be something like twenty percent, um, and then there's a bunch of money sitting um, and not undeployed. And so, how can we think about um, integrated capital, whether that's patient um, capital, whether it's um, uh, recoverable grants or things like that, other tools, other finance tools that we can use to really build power in the communities. Going from funder governance to community governance, so thinking about as a funder or investor, how are you um, moving power as you make the, the investment? So it, are you retaining the power? Are you the decision maker constantly? Or is it going to, is that power moving to the community as, as the money moves? Um, and then just thinking about long-term economic power. Is the money, as it's moving, creating long-term economic power in the communities where you're investing? Or is it extractive um, and it, it intended to sort of extract from that community? So I think as we think about impact-first investing, really centering uh, community needs um, it is the, a powerful place to start um, as um, we're investing in communities. So yeah, hand it back. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move into how do I actually do this in practice? This was a lot of words, a lot of frameworks. Um, but doing this work, uh, I would just pause and say that each three of our organizations are building the infrastructure to be able to be very flexible and responsive to the different types of investments needed and the different types of structures that are needed to center community. So in this conversation, we're bringing forward a lot of the learnings that we've had over so many years. We weren't 
just coming into the space knowing what was needed, a lot of what has informed the, what we are talking about today um, is through trial and error, is through working with different communities, understanding and seeing what it is that was working and what it is that wasn't working. Um, and listening and internalizing that and then building our own frameworks off of, off of that. So I'll start with uh, Community Credit Lab and, and this goes hand in hand with Common Future as well. Um, and the example that I'll be providing with was actually a joint project that we both worked on. Um, so at Community Credit Lab, everything that we do is community defined and community led. So the frameworks that we use when we're, when we're trying to identify different opportunities for us to get involved um, fall within these three pillars of our work. The first one is increasing affordability. So we know that, and we have heard, and we have seen, um, that wealth cannot be created in communities if we continue to charge them higher interest rates, if we continue to, continue to extract more capital from them, rather than allowing them the flexibility and patience to test and try new ideas and keep that capital, that interest, within their communities. The second piece is increasing access. So when we talk about increasing access to capital, that's thrown around a lot in our, in our sector. Um, and the way that Community Credit Lab and Common Future defines this is that the people that are closest to, to the communities um, that are experiencing this, this lack of, of affordable capital in there and these capital gaps in their communities should be the ones designing the underwriting criteria. Who gets capital? Who doesn't get capital? They should be making the decisions. They should be designing those terms. They should be telling us what is it that they need in their community, not the other way around. And so we work with our, our different community partners to, to co-create some of that design together. And then this third piece that we've, we've started to hint towards th throughout this conversation and what Lem was talking about with, with that community governance and community led, is this piece around shifting power. Shifting power means that at, at Community Credit Lab, we're not the ones deciding who gets the loans. We're not the ones deciding who, makes the, who gets the investment. It's our community partners who are saying, this is the small business in my community that needs capital and they need it at, the, at these terms and we have been working with them and we know who they are and they need that capital at this term, make it happen. So we make it happen. <laughs> and we're shifting power, we're allowing our partners to take that space. And we're not allowing it, we're just setting the stage. We're, we're allowing them to come in and take that power um, and show us what is actually needed. So we actually worked with Common Future um, about a year and a half ago to design what is called a character-based lending fund. And typically how capital maybe flows or is designed in maybe the traditional spaces, uh, the traditional finance spaces is um, you decide, okay, I have this much capital, this is the return I need, and so now I'm gonna go out and seek out opportunities that match with that. But we know that doesn't work for our communities that are that lack access to capital, um, that are that are that need something that is different. Um, so Common Future played an integral role as a as a convener, not only a convener of partners, but a convener of capital. Um, and Community Credit Lab played the role of a facilitator, meaning that we are facilitating the design process, we're facilitating the actual lending process. And then we have our capital allocators who are Native Women Lead, Connect Up Institute, and Mortar. The process of, of this fund was actually, instead of starting with, hey, this is we have, we have a million dollars and we want to get 2%, rather than start there, we said, okay, Native Women Lead, Connect Up Institute, and Mortar, what is the capital that you need in your community? What do are, what are your businesses need that you're working so closely with? And they told us, this is what we need. Um, these are the terms that would be accessible for our businesses. And it was different. It was way different from what they're seeing out there. These are really, really patient, flexible terms um, between zero and 3% interest, loans between three and seven years, repayment terms that were, you know, you had a, a delayed repayment uh, of, of six months to allow our, our, the, their businesses to get capital 
to receive that capital, do something with it, and then start earning revenue to start re repaying those loans. And they have the flexibility to tell Community Credit Lab, hey, actually, I can't make this payment this month, so let's skip it and make it another month. Um, so they designed the loan programs. Community Credit Lab and Common Future came together and said, OK, here's, all the, here's the vast number of programs that exist. Um, what's the capital that we need to fund that? And that's how it was designed. And so we went out to the market and we raised grants, recoverable grants, promissory notes at 0% interest to be able to provide the flexibility experimentation that's needed for each of our enterprise support or entrepreneur support organizations to do what they needed. So when I think about this, um, and then at, after the capital is raised, they're the ones telling us, hey, this is where the capital needs to go. Make this loan. Do that. <laughs> Make that loan. Um, help us uh, assess if this is, is working or not. So why is this working? Um, these are the three pieces, kind of this three, the, th the three pieces of our framework around increasing access, increasing affordability, and shifting power. Um, so we started with the community rooted organizations to design the program rather than um, just deciding what, what terms they needed to be designed at. In terms of affordability, again, we're not saying what capital needs to be, what, what's the return we're seeking. We're saying what does the, what's the return that the community wants and let's match the capital to, to do that work. And then shifting power, our partners are allocating this capital. They are directing where it needs to go. They're using different governance structures within their own communities to decide how capital needs to flow. So I will pause there and shift it to Lauren to talk a little bit about Mission Driven Finance's method. Thanks, Sandhya. And this is I, just adding for onto what she shared earlier, the three of us are doing infrastructure work. We are effectively capital plumbing, um, which is dreadfully unsexy a lot of the time. Um, but we can the, we work with so many different examples. So as questions come up, feel free to put them into the app. I will figure out how that works. Um, and we'll follow up with you afterward if you have um, specific questions from examples that come up through this. I mentioned that we work with clients and partners across the country to design, develop, and manage impact capital vehicles. I'm happy to say so many of them are here today at SOCAP. Um, so we'll get to share some of those examples. But what we look, what that looks like in the design process, I can, can go deep into the building and the, the managing, but in the design, that's the key piece, is we start with why, but why and who. Uh, you may have heard from Simon Sinek, who has this fantastic TED Talk, Start With Why. I have a variation on it that has who and why. You already heard from Sandhya that thinking about who are the communities that are most impacted, whose voices have been overlooked and underestimated, who understands the challenge that is happening on the ground, and how can we center those voices, those experiences? What do they need? How can we then think about uh, what, like how do we want to be in relationship with that? What is our process that's going to be respectful and also have the right voices at the table? Um, and from there, then getting to, well then what does that actually look like in practice? What, the what comes last instead of it being, I'm looking for a 6% return and quarterly interest payments, thank you so much. Uh, we start with, what does the community need? And then what is the right capital structure that allows that to come into being? So I'll, uh, next slide has another example. They're going to sound or a thesis, excuse me. I use this formula, very simplified way to get into what does it look like to create an investment thesis? But if we invest X kind of capital and Q kind of support into Y initiatives, then we expect Z impact and financial returns. And using this simple formula helps you to be really clear about who are you centering with those Y initiatives? What are they trying to do to create that Z impact? And from that impact, then you also have, with this nice if-then statement, have a good framework for selection and for ongoing monitoring. Is this working? How is this going? Um, so, it's a great way to simplify very complex financial strategies into a four-part formula. <laughs> um, 
an example, building off of the one that Sandia shared, uh, some of the same folks that we've been in relationship for a long time. Uh, the Matriarch Revolutionary Fund with indigenous women in New Mexico uh, have been working with us to say, how can we add on to the program that we ran with co-op capital, um, a 10, 000, up to $10,000 loans, and then working with Sandia and their team, I think 10 to $50,000 loans. What about those businesses that grow beyond the 10 to $50,000 loans, what, how can we help them continue to scale and grow? So their thesis boiled down into, if we invest 50 to $250,000 at three to 5% interest and provide this technical assistance network, helping indigenous women entrepreneurs to navigate all those different webinars and workshops and uh, back office bookkeepers that are so critical to business growth, then we can help them to both return investor principal and also uh, rematriate economic power. To indigenous women are the centers of their families, they are the center, they are the primary breadwinners, and so lifting up indigenous women is a way to lift up all of the indigenous communities. Um, and so that's the thesis. That's what this looks like in practice. And three to 5% came from if we can get cheaper capital to them, cheaper than what the SBA puts out, cheaper than what a lot of CDFIs put out, no offense to all of our friends, uh, that we can uh, increase what they can do. You meet a lot of scrappy entrepreneurs and they can stretch a dollar. So if you can get that capital into their hands, they will do more for their communities. They will invest more in their teams. And that's what we're looking for. One last example, because I know they're here, um, and a completely different structure. Uh, LA Clean Tech Incubator, working with Hyder, who's I think somewhere in the back. Um, but they work with early stage clean tech companies and entrepreneurs that are trying to get really cool and innovative technologies going, but they can't get from getting a contract, their first contract, or a grant from the National Science Foundation or something else. They can't bridge to actually execute on that contract. So we said, what does it look like to provide first customer financing? You landed a cool contract with a municipality in Southern California, fantastic. How are you gonna do it? So we have, an, uh, one of the loans that we make is an interest-only structure so that you can just make very light payments and then when that big payday comes in when you get reimbursed, then you pay the loan back. Um, but that's a higher risk structure. It is something that said, this is what we have heard from working with clean tech entrepreneurs for a decade uh, and what they need is a product that serves this specific gap. So that's where we started, is really listening to them, what do they need? So when Possibility Lab started, um, we, um, like Community Credit Lab and Mission Driven, started with this thesis that if we send to the people who are most impacted, in finance, in thinking about infrastructure for finance, in thinking about like community development, um, we could create new infrastructure and in partnership, collectively, we could just kind of uh, create a whole way of doing finance, like a whole new way of doing finance. And I think that's um, a lot of the stories that we just heard. Um, and one of the, the problems that kept coming up over and over again is a lot of the, the folks that were in our communities um, were trying to do new, innovative, um, sort of cutting edge power building in their communities. It might look like launching a new co-op. It might look like um, a really fast paced land acquisition that took you know, housing off the speculative market so folks in our community could afford it. Um, there are a variation, it might look like starting up, you know, a lot of new new businesses, starting a community loan fund that was very community driven um, and centered uh, the needs of black and brown and low income communities in terms of, you know, loan terms or integrated capital deployment and things like that. But the infrastructure for it wasn't really there. And by infrastructure, we mean people data process. 
Um, and underneath that, you know, how risk is assessed, what kind of data you're collecting, um, how underwriting works, um, how you get something up and started, the process that it, it takes to be able to get enough capital to uh, get something up and, and started and have the infrastructure right away to, to, to move quickly. Um, so all of those things, people were having a hard time finding resources to do that. And so that was the impetus for Possibility Labs. Um, and as we designed it, we came up with this sort of, uh, I shouldn't say we came up with it. We deployed this formula, <laughs> uh, focusing on people, data, and process. People, um, who's, who's at the table? Who's, um, who's in our communities? Um, what, do, what do they need? Those kinds of things. Who's driving? Is the power shifting that direction? Um, and um, yeah, what what are the what are the real needs in the community? Um, and we found you know some of the similar things: flexible terms, um, being able to structure their uh, you know how they're receiving capital. Sometimes it's being able to structure how they're deploying capital, being close to folks. So we're working with um, a a group that's funding black and brown farmers across both the Midwest and the South. And you know they're finding things like that that are very um, old, like being able to start equipment co-ops, they're so undercapitalized because you need like so much money to buy equipment in these communities. And, and um, so you need to have access to that capital. And it needs to be, you need to have access to it for a long time because uh, you're not starting from the same place to say be able to pay it off in five years or 10 years. Um, like some of the terms on the equipment is uh, to begin with. Um, and so they're you know, designing these integrated capital tools where there are like pretty substantial guarantees. Um, they're first loss in the pools and they're deploying the capital at like 1% interest. And they're being able to acquire the capital at one and 0% interest as well, which is going a long way to solve a problem. You know, there's 1% of farmers are um, black 1% 1, 1 of farm owners, I should say, are black in the United States. And so like to, to start from that point and try to build power in those ways, you're just starting from a lot lower place of capital. So to be able to um, deploy it so flexibly is really important. But this group also didn't have the infrastructure to be able to raise the capital and deploy the capital. And some of the things that they didn't have is the groups where the capital is coming from, even though it was very flexible terms, require them to have a much bigger balance sheet. Um, or because they're um, deploying, um, they're, they're getting low interest capital, they had to have tax exemption. Um, so you know the IRS wants us to charge certain interest rates, and if you're not gonna charge that interest rate, you need to be tax exempt to get that capital. And so we're helping them be able to take in that capital, and they're taking it into Possibility Labs, and deploy it in ways that really center the needs of um, the farmers. And they're close, like these are some of the some of the folks in the group are from finance, and some are farmers themselves. Um, but they're able to deploy it in community and in community practices and in community traditions without all the sort of headache of the old stodgy finance infrastructure that I know all of us want to blow up if we could. And we have to be compliant at the same time. And so uh, you know that is. Um, some, some of the things that we're helping with as well. So I think that's a, a concrete example of what it means to center people. The data piece um, is twofold. One, it's about understanding what are the metrics that communities find important, and that's about shifting power. The other is, what are the metrics that, say, the SEC or the IRS or our investors find important? Um, and so being able to track both of those things um, and uh, you know, part of what we do is build uh, integrated data infrastructure that takes the burden off of, um, and some of what y'all do as well, that takes the burden off of the community. So we're working with uh, a community loan fund that's actually a black organizing project is how they started. They're, they're you know, raising capital at a pretty successful rate. Um, they're targeting uh, about $20 million for this year, and they just don't have the infrastructure to do the SEC reporting that's necessary to run a loan fund and in a state that hasn't really had nonprofit loan funds before. Um, and so we're helping them build out their back office infrastructure, sort of deploying what we've already built and already invested in 
um, for them to be able to, to do that without the headache um, and at a cost that's like, you know, manageable. So I think that's the, 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 it takes a lot of money to build out integrated data infrastructure and yet that data is what is needed to be able to raise capital at um, the scale that folks need. Um, and so for them to be able to sort of stick to the, the community organizing practices, even in how the capital is deployed, is going to be funding um, black businesses and they'll be, you know, doing patient capital loans and um, going in places where CDFIs and um, banks just like they, their risk assessment doesn't allow them to do that. Um, and so rethinking how risk works um, and doing it in a trust-based way, they still have to comply with how that state's SEC sees risk. Um, and so we've um, been able to help them with that. And then process, again, um, you know, starting with people, how, what kinds of processes get to the solutions that our communities really need? Um, it's certainly not, you know, having to go through big loan applications. It's not, you know, having to go through these like arduous underwriting processes. Um, and even thinking about like what it feels like sometimes to be a, a black or brown person uh, in a low income community and you walk into a bank, like that emotion, taking that emotional experience and, you know, reverse engineering it so it's totally different and it feels good and it feels like powerful and it feels like you have self-determination when you do that. I think that's what, what we think about when it's when we think about like how do we create processes that really center the needs of our communities. Um, and then how do we integrate all these things um, so that uh, what we get is um, capital and infrastructure that's both moving at the speed of trust but and also at the speed of business. And so that is what we're focused on. Thank you, Lem. <clears throat> I'm actually gonna call an audible because this question came up in my head as, as both of you were talking. Um, and I'm curious from both of your perspectives, and you can take either, either direction you want, what's a question that you wish either an investor or a community partner asked during, this, during a process of like designing a um, investment that was supposed to be community-led or community-driven or, or solving a problem for a community? I love that question. I work with about a dozen partners that I'm, I'm like their lead consultant, so that's a lot. Um, but they're, my favorite questions to get into are structural and governance, which is not, not always the most exciting. But again, Lem was touching on there is a lot of compliance. And if you are trying to unlock millions of dollars, Unfortunately, this is why I got into impact investing. I worked in nonprofits and philanthropy before. What gets given away is insufficient to address the social challenges that we have. There's just drop in the bucket. So how can we activate more capital for social change? Uh, we need to be able to use the tools that are the regulations of their uh, current investment industry. And that is really boring. I'm not gonna lie, I read a lot of SEC compliance manuals and what con con constitutes investment advisory services. So we don't wanna put that burden onto community partners. They want a fund to exist. They do not wanna figure out how to run a fund. They do not wanna figure out how to run capital calls. But talking about who should own the legal entity of a fund and how are other roles that could happen if they don't own the equity of the vehicle, can they have the benefit of working with a partner like Mission Driven Finance to be able to meet the SEC compliance, meet investor standards, um, and yet continue to center voice? That's my favorite question to get into, is what can the structure look like that allows a lot of different voices to be heard at different stages of the process? I love the question and that question. Um, I think I think it would be where do I sit at this table um, on both sides. So I think I wish um, that you know when investors were coming to the table and 
they were trying to figure out how to do impact first investing or how to do a you know structure a specific deal, the question would be you know where where do I sit at this table as in um, how do I center community power in this conversation? On the flip side, I think that sometimes in our communities we've sort of been trained to cater to power in ways that are not helpful. Um, and so I think I would say the same question, like where do I sit? Where do I sit at this table? As in, where's the power seat at the table? <laughs> and um, how do we get our community in that, that seat? Because that's where we should be um, in this conversation. Yeah, what about you? Yeah, I think that both of those questions are really like hitting at the center of where I was trying to go as well. So it was good job, you guys. <laughs> um, but I think the, the main question that I would maybe center is how do we step completely outside of the box that we know that is comfortable and that will provide maybe certain returns or certain um, safety nets that we thought we needed? And how do we lean into building relationship first so that we can operate from a place of trust rather than operating and building in all of these complex structures to make sure that when there's a downside, there's some protection. How do we build relationship first together um, so that we can do away with a lot of the things that are actually saddling a lot of the in this investment from actually moving forward? As my attorneys like to remind us, all investments have risk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they, we have had outsized perceptions of risk in the communities that we're talking about. Folks who have been overlooked and underestimated, they're not actually defaulting on loans as much as one might think they are. So how can we push on those structures of saying that one client that was told by a bank will invest if we have 100% loan loss reserve? And I said, hold on, let's unpack that for a second. That means you believe every single loan to these entrepreneurs of color is going to go bad day one. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I don't believe in you. And so how can we flip that, again, to be in relationship first, to be in trust first, to see possibility, possibility labs. Um, how can we see that opportunity and center that? Thank you. So now, over to you all. How will you shift? How will you shift power? How will you shift the way that you're currently operating? Um, so we have a little prompt for you. Um, I won't lead it, re lead it. I won't read it completely out loud, but um, essentially there's a group of enterprise or entrepreneur support organizations. They're seeing that capital is not coming to their communities um, and they want to design something. They want to design a fund to support those local businesses and attract local investors to seed that fund. So if you're in the room today, and you are typically someone who is seeking capital, I want you to play the role of someone who is actually an investor or a local investor um, and, and kind of work through some of the questions that we have here. And then if, if you are someone who is typically um, deploying capital, sit across the table or in someone else's shoes and be the one who's seeking capital and what are some of those questions that, that you would start asking. So just wanted to make sure that we leave you with takeaways um, and these tangible practices. Again, uh, you can access each of us through the app. I can't promise how quickly we'll respond to you, but you can access us through the app for a long time um, and be able to follow up with, with questions on implementation because that's where things get uh, dicey. So wanted to leave everybody with some, some final thoughts and some key takeaways. Yeah, and also one more plug in the app. There is a framework that both, or I should say all three of us um, worked on together 
over the past few months that starts with questions and not answers. So um, a, lot of, a lot of the conversation that we've been having today is how do we understand what our communities need? How do we show up in a place? How do we provide capital in place that is, that is right sized? Um, so in the app, or in the app and on our session, there is a link to a document that has a whole framework of questions that we've co-designed um, to help you all on your journey going forward. Um, and as Lauren mentioned, um, you can, in that is, is also our contact information. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions along the way. Um, I guess I will start with Lem to just have one key takeaway for the group today. Thanks, yeah, so I would say thinking about um, how you're shifting power and going back to the sort of moving from the transaction to the transformation, like how how is the impact transformational and how is the power shifting in any money that's moving? Thanks, Lem. And adding to Sonia's point on questions, I am a philosophy major, so I love a Socratic method. People try and distill designing an impact thesis into uh, like perfect little boxes. It's going to vary community by community. It's going to vary case by case. And so these questions are meant to be a guide for the kinds of conversations to have and even the way to ask the questions so that you're not reinforcing funky power dynamics. So just being mindful of the way that we phrase things and um, my only takeaway was hearing from some folks that really wanted to continue having a lot of impact um, reporting after an investment and thinking about that too as a request of energy that can be extractive and so balancing what is the right level of information to be requesting from the, the folks that you invest in to say we're on the right track versus I am making you spend a lot of time filling out a report. Um, so just thinking about where the energy gets invested. Thank you, Lem and Lauren. My last comment will be that we're trying to actually change systems. We are trying to change a traditional financial investment system that's not working for everyone. And to do that, we all have to get deeply uncomfortable and ask a lot of questions and look inward in order to best support our entire community. So if you're not feeling uncomfortable or feeling a little bit like, am I supposed to be shifting in this way? Like, it's okay. We can be deeply uncomfortable. That's what's required. Because if we're not uncomfortable, we're just kind of plugging into the same system. So get uncomfortable. <laughs> And thank you all for joining us today. Appreciate you all engaging with us and, and engaging in these questions that we asked of you all. I hope you all had a chance to also connect with everyone at your table. Lauren, Lem, and I will be on the side over here if you want to ask us any questions. And we'll be at SOCAP for the rest of the day. So feel free to stop us if you see us. Thank you.